There used to be this uh, awful TV show about 30 years ago. I don't remember a lot about it. I didn't watch it a lot, but I do remember there, there was sort of a line out of that show that became famous. Uh, one of the characters often said, I love when a plan comes together. And I thought of that line this morning as we worshiped because uh, it seemed like nearly everything we did uh, went along with what I want to share with you. That wasn't our plan because we really didn't communicate between ourselves, but the, song, the songs, the, the, the cooperative reading we did and about everything went right along with it. And you know, sometimes you can plan that um, as a group, but uh, I think that was more the Lord's doing and more often than not, that happens. And so I love when a plan comes together if it's God's. And uh, that was a great encouragement. And nothing uh, slaps you harder in the face than reality. And nothing does better to wake a person up than ice cold splash of reality. There was a farmer who was coming out of his fields along the back roads of a remote area and just as he pulled out on the road, a city slicker came speeding up over the hilltop and hit him and his entire rig. And, and so, uh, bad accident, the farmer is lying there, he's pinned under his wagon, his, his dog is not far away, his mule is across the road, uh, on the other side in a ditch, and there they are, and the, the, the driver just sped off. Well, about that time, a, a car pulled up, and the farmer thought, well, at last, someone is going to help me, and when he saw it was the sheriff, he felt even more relieved, and so the sheriff came, and, and, and he looked over the situation carefully, sort of evaluated things, saw that the mule had a mangled leg and was really suffering terribly, so he, he pulled out his revolver and shot it to end its misery. He then walked across the road and saw the dog was even worse off than the mule and, and shot him to end his misery. Then the sheriff walked back over to the farmer and, and asked if he was in much pain. <laughs> and the farmer said, never felt better in my life. <laughs> yes, the, the ice cold splash of reality. You know, the Bible often calls us back to reality on many things. And perhaps the biggest reality each of us needs to deal with on a regular basis is the reality of God. His majesty, his greatness, his holiness. Does your knowledge of God include those characteristics? Jesus said in John chapter 17 and verse 3, he was praying to the Father at this time, and he said, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus says, notice, that that is the key to eternal life. The key. What is it? Knowing God. And friends, if you don't know about and respect and live under his majesty and his greatness and his holiness, then you don't really know him. And maybe, in fact, you're devoted to something or someone other than the one true God. See, as, as Christians living today, we many times have a problem with these particular characteristics of God. We're over-impressed with things in our world and under-impressed with the Rock of Ages. We bow down to modern heroes, whether they be athletes or influencers or politicians, and we often ignore the one who created them all. 
We understand how much our world can take our focus off of our God. And, and too often we have great thoughts of people and small thoughts of God. A lot of times I hear people emphasizing, thinking about the, the personal God in our day and time. The God who gently walks and talks with them. But the Creator, what about Him? The one who actually holds our life in His hands, what about Him? The judge of all the earth, to whom every knee shall bow. What about him? The one who controls the universe, who holds it all together, without whom it would all fall apart, because he, remember, brought order out of chaos. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Remember those opening verses? Those opening words of scripture? In the beginning, God, what about him? Is your God too small? Have you shrunk your God? Is our faith weak? Is our worship stale? Is our zeal extinguished? If so, then, then what we need is a good dose of reality. The reality about God. Perhaps we need slapped in the face and woke up about this to the reality of the majesty and greatness and holiness of our God. I know that the nation of Israel needed that. God's chosen people, those who had been eyewitnesses to his mighty power, they needed woken up at times. So if you need that, don't feel bad you're not the first one. If this is a problem for us today, how do we correct it? Let's remember some lessons that God tried to teach Israel. Now, how do we deal with the problem of our thoughts of God being too small? Because if we want strong faith, if we want revitalized worship, or more devotion, if we want renewed zeal, it can only happen in the presence of an all-powerful God. What do we need to do? A couple of things. We need to first remove any thoughts in our minds that limits God in any way. God is without limits by his very nature. It's, it's easy to, to think of things that limit us. You know, time, finances, energy, desire, sin. But none of those things, you see, applies to God. God is eternal. God is not bound by time. He can see the beginning and the end of everything. From his perspective, he could be speaking to Moses from the burning bush and watching your heart right now to see how you're receiving this message about him. It's a fact that he is unlimited. The psalmist expressed it better than I ever could in the 139th Psalm. Psalm 139, I want to read six verses of that psalm for you this morning from a, what I think is an interesting translation you may never have heard of before. It's called the God's Word translation. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6, it begins, O Lord, you have Examine me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I get up. You read my thoughts from far away. You watch me when I travel and when I rest. 
You're familiar with all my ways. Even before there's a single word on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You are all around me, in front of me and in back of me. You lay your hand on me. Such knowledge is beyond my grasp. It's so high, I cannot reach it. You see, you see how these kind of thoughts of God could possibly inspire faith, could inspire worship, could inspire devotion. If your thoughts are big enough about him. I think of Job. You know, Job was a righteous man who suffered greatly. And he wondered why. Why is this happening to me? Maybe you, you're familiar with that question. So Job asked God why. And in chapters 38 through 41 of the book of Job, God responded to, to his uh, question. The way he responded was by giving Job his resume of greatness. I'd encourage you to read God's resume of greatness in chapters 38 through 41 of Job. God never answers Job's question of why he was suffering the way he was suffering. Never directly answers it. But in response to Job's honest searching question, God, why is this happening to me? God, why must I hurt? God says, Job, I'm great. I'm great. Look at Job's response to that in chapter 42 of the book, verses 1 through 6. After God said, Job, I'm great. Job says, basically, I forgot. I forgot for a while who you are, God. Please forgive me. You're my God. And if that's the case, I can deal with it. I can deal with any situation. We need to remove any limits that we have put on God in our mind. That's the first thing. The second thing is we need to compare God with things that we consider great. I don't know in your life what you think is great. But whatever it is, compare it to God and see how it really stacks up. This is, this is what God did for Israel in Isaiah chapter 40. I want us to read a little bit in that chapter before we finish this morning. If you want to open the 40th chapter of Isaiah. In this chapter, God is speaking to a bunch of depressed people downcast people, people whose faith is sort of hanging on by a thread. They're in despair. These people think everything is stacked against them. All the odds are against them, and they'll never again prosper in God's eyes and God's work. You see, their thoughts of God were too small. Their God who was the God of Mount Sinai, who was the God of the Red Sea crossing, had shrunk in their minds. Only in their minds, but that was important for them. They thought that this God was locked away in a faraway land from which they had been exiled. And so he couldn't do anything for them where they were. But God comes knocking on their prison cell door and he says, remember me? Remember who I am? Look at it. Verses 12, 13, and 14. It's very similar language to what God used with Job. God says, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span? 
enclosed the, the dust of the earth, earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? This is a sampling of the questions God asked them. God says, do you remember who I am? Do you remember my great works? Now, he may be asking you the same question this morning. It could very well be happening that God is asking you something like, do you remember how I washed you clean at your baptism? Do you remember how I helped you in your marriage? Do you remember how I gave health where sickness seemed so powerful? Do you remember my mighty works in your life? Beginning then in verse 15 of the text, God compares himself to great nations. They can't stand against him. We might put it into more modern terms. We might say something like, do you remember the Soviet Union? Some of us are old enough to remember the fear of the Cold War. Do you remember Saddam's Iraq? You see, great nations are nothing before God. Whatever happened to Rome? Where is the empire of Greece? And someday, if God lingers, some preacher may be standing in a place like this and, and saying, whatever happened to the United States? Verse 22, God is compared to the earth itself. It says there, Isaiah 40, 22, it is he, God, who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. You know, there are those today who worship the earth and its environment, but the earth compared to God, the creator, it's nothing. The earth is, is like God's footstool. He sits enthroned above it. He is in control of it. And all the hustle and bustle that consumes us daily on this globe, it's like grasshoppers jumping in a field before God. God is above all that. Verses 23 and 24, God is compared to powerful men. Listen to what it says. Who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Think of the top two or three people in the world that people admire, that people are impressed with. I don't know who that would be, but how do they compare to the greatness of God? Do we need a reality check here? You know, you've probably done a price check or two in the last couple of weeks. How about a reality check today about our God? And who he is. And then in verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number. Calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might. And because he is strong in power. Not one is missing. To me, one of the most awe-inspiring sights in the world is star-filled sky. 
it so impressed people in the ancient world that they often turned to worshiping what they could see in the sky. They worshiped the stars, and, and some still do today when they take stock in horoscopes and astrology. But think of the one who put the stars there. How great must he be? How awesome. He knows how many there are exactly. And he has a name for each one. No scientist on earth can match that. So there's nothing to compare him to. There's no rival. There's no equal to God. As we wrap this up, God asks three questions really to people who struggle with, with his majesty and greatness. Originally, of course, to Israel, he asked these questions, but these questions come to us today. Each one, each question has an implied rebuke. Question number one comes in, in verse 25 where he says, To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Hear that question? That question rebukes wrong thoughts about God. Again, are your thoughts of God too small, too human? Is he limited in some way in your mind? Has he shrunk Remember, he's not like us. He's God, we are not. We're not even little gods. Question number two comes in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? This question rebukes wrong thoughts about ourselves you ever feel abandoned by God you ever feel like he's forgotten you that he doesn't have time for you for your insignificant problems if so then your thoughts about God are too small that is never the case he has not and he will not abandon you he does not forget things except for our sins. That's because of what Jesus did. But he doesn't forget. He doesn't overlook. He doesn't get bored and lose interest in your plight as if he were just one of us because that's the stuff we do. God is not like that. He doesn't forget. And finally, question number three, it's in verse 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. The, this question rebukes our slowness to believe God's greatness. Has your God grown old or tired as you have grown old or tired? Has he become forgetful as you become forgetful? Has your God become bored as you've become bored? Then you serve the wrong God. Your thoughts of him are too small. If that's the case, he is the everlasting God. He is the creator of the earth and the universe who doesn't get bored, who doesn't get tired, who doesn't forget. This is the God we came to worship this morning. Have we? This is the God we're called to serve this week. Will we? Let your thoughts of God be big. 
be majestic, be awesome. Serve the one true God revealed in Scripture. Don't settle for some cheap miniature imitation. God is great. Just wanted you to think with me about that this morning. As we conclude, if, if you need to respond to this God's invitation that comes to you through his son Jesus Christ, who died for you at the cross, as we've remembered today, if you need to come to him for whatever reason this morning, we have a convenient time. We sing a song to get you maybe think about it. And if we can serve you in some way in your service to him, praying for you, helping you with your obedience to him, we want to do so. Just let us know while we stand, while we sing.